I'm going to let uh, Rebecca and Brandy introduce themselves as our uh, other co-lead members. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rebecca Roth. I am the Office Director for Policy Planning and Research at the Bureau for Behavioral Health. And I'm so glad that you're with us today. And um, thank you to Kim for facilitating the meeting. Over to you, Brandy. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Brandy Schoolcraft. I'm the secretary for the policy planning and research in the Bureau for Behavioral Health. I'm under Kim and Rebecca. Um, thank you guys for joining us today and we appreciate everyone being here. Okay, uh, just to start off with a review of our mission for this meeting. It is uh, to facilitate statewide prevention and treatment activities by leading a systematic process to gather, review, analyze, and disseminate information about substance use and abuse in West Virginia. Um, rephrased, it would be um, aiming to prevent silos in our work and further our actions and outcomes across the state through data-informed planning and considerations. Um, if you would all please mute uh, your sound just in case. Uh, raise your hands during the presentation and if you have questions feel free to put them in the chat box or wait until uh, the question section for each presenter. I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce Laura Hunt. She's the director of the Office of Quality Assurance for Children's Programs and she has a presentation for us. Hi, Kim. Good afternoon, everybody. I have a couple slides um, I can show you, but um, like Kim said, the um, Office of Quality Assurance for Children's Programs was, was set up um, at the beginning of May 2022. Um, and so I will go ahead and share those slides so that um, you know, you all can get acquainted with a little bit about um, the work that we're doing and um, what we hope to continue to do. Good to see everybody. Right. So originally in uh, May 2019, the um, Department of Justice went into an agreement with the DHHR um, to, to further look at, um, at data and improve upon um, well-being for, for children with serious emotional disorders. And so through this, um, you know, there's a lot of elements that the state is working towards um, as far as um, improving systems for children and families to help reduce um, to reduce the use of um, residential mental health treatment facilities um, when appropriate and connect children with community and home-based services. Um, so in addition to this, um, the state legislature met and um, they enacted House Concurrent Resolution, um, so HCR 35. And so that requests that the DHHR continuously evaluate the child wel welfare system um, and that that establish a continuous evaluation and improvement system that measures outcomes for children and families in, child well, in the child welfare system um, and outcomes for children with serious emotional disorders served by the department across the bureaus of the department and other state agencies serving children in collaboration with existing divisions and units within the department that measure and evaluate performance. Um, so basically what all that means is, um, you know, it's, quite the long title, the Office of Quality Assurance for Children's Programs. So I've just been calling it the Office of QA, um, if that's simpler for folks to remember and to say. But, um, you know, the primary focus for the Office of QA right now is to, um, to really focus on the system in place and the pathways for um, children with um, SED or serious emotional disorders. Um, and so that is the first, the first focus. And so with that, um, you know, we're working with 
the the bureaus throughout the throughout the DHHR um, to ensure that families have very simple pathways um, to get to get into uh, mental health services and when needed um, appropriate assessment to determine um, if residential is needed. Um, so with that, we can keep a close eye on, um, you know, how these processes are implemented, what's working well, and what may need, need further improvement. So as far as um, House Concurrent Resolution 35, um, you know, we are required that we report to the Legislative Oversight Commission um, for Health and Human Resources accountability um, during the regular legislative sessions. And then, um, you know, long term, um, the the office is um, within the office of the cabinet secretary for the DHHR. So, um, you know, this is not just related to the DOJ agreement that was established in 2019. This really goes beyond, um, you know, including the concurrent resolution um, by the House, um, so that it will eventually cover matters um, that also include child welfare, but. Um, you know, more specifically, the focus right now is to ensure that um, the children and families can access um, mental health services in their homes and communities when that's possible for them. Um, so really just that long term goal of um, transparency and data and um, continuous quality improvements with with the systems that are put in place um, to help children and families overall. So um, how will we do this? So, um, you know, the DHHR is, you know, continuing to expand on data culture, um, which basically just means using data as um, a tool in the tool belt for regular conversations rather than, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of us may have been guilty in the past of, of having conversations where we say, okay, this meeting is specifically to look at data. Um, and we can only talk about data in this context, whereas now we're starting to see folks, you know, almost any conversation they have, um, they can be able to pull in a statistic or a map or whatever it may be, um, so that they can start to utilize that information to inform their decision making. Um, so we're not going off of our gut reactions. We know um, what is happening in the state and, um, you know, some opportunities to either improve upon it or sustain it. Um, so with that, we do have a continuous quality improvement plan and indicators that we look at on a regular basis. Um, and I will go over a couple of those with you all today, just at a very high level, so you can see kind of what we're looking at. Um, but, you know, again, that long-term planning um, and movement for data needs, you know, some of the things need to be established and, and some items need to be continued to be looked at. Um, so at the DHHR level, we are reviewing data quarterly. Um, we are in the process of building out monthly reviews for some indicators that, um, that we can keep, keep tabs on to make sure things are going the right way, you know, such as, as information about referrals, um, admissions to residential mental health services, um, thing, things that are very timely that we can keep a close eye on. Um, and then in addition to that, um, sharing information with um, stakeholders and our partners through the Kids Thrive Collaborative and the Commission to Study Residential Placement of Children. Um, but, you know, just really looking for opportunities to share this information um, with, with anyone that it helps with their work or, you know, to help families um, be, be aware and connected with, with the services that are offered. So um, we have a semi-annual report that comes out twice a year. Our most recent one was rele released on um, July 29th, and that is on the Kids Thrive website. So that website's listed there. Um, and so in those reports, that's really a, a summary of the past six months um, of available data. And so it's to identify those strengths and opportunities for improvement and then also to identify any barriers or issues associated so that we can have clear next steps. Um, you know, we're reviewing the data, but then we're acting on the data as well. Um, so for that report, it was for um, data considered July 2021 through December 2021. Um, but we did look at some trends going back 18 months just to see um, 
you know, how different seasonalities might change or if there's, there's long lasting impacts on that. Um, and then we did include some newer data that, that fell, you know, um, earlier into the year for 2022, um, as we are seeing expansion in um, some of the screening activities and things like that are, that are going in the state. Um, so I won't go into depth on this. I just wanted to include this to kind of give you all an idea of some of the things that we're looking at. So, um, you know, we're trying to approach um, families' connection with mental health services, um, you know, from the start um, to the, the, the potential end um, for them. So, you know, starting first with screening. Um, screening is offered in a variety of um of you know entryways, and um, so the health check screening program, which is through the Bureau for Public Health, um, they are doing mental health screenings through their well child visits, and those are are being referred through what we call the assessment pathway, which allows children to be assessed for their need of whether they can be um, served in community um, based services such as wraparound, um, or if there is a need. A recommended need to go to a residential facility if that child doesn't have the supports they need or if they have a higher level level of need. So in addition to that, um, the through um, the Bureau for Social Services, um, the youth services and um, child protective services are also doing screening and referrals. Um, we also have um, the Bureau for Juvenile um, Services doing those referrals as well. And one of the things that we were able to glean from this data was that, um, you know, they are seeing a very high um, percentage positive screens for the, the youth that are in um, juvenile services um, as they come in. They actually saw that 81% of the children that were screened were positive. Um, now, when they're in BJS custody, um, that wouldn't be considered necessarily a home and community-based service. So one of the next steps that we're going to be taking out of this is to coordinate that process so that um, referrals can be made. And once a child comes home from um, juvenile services custody, um, they, can, they could begin services immediately. Um, so that's just one example of how we're looking at that information and being able to act on it very quickly. Um, in addition to that, probation services has, has began to, um, to screen the, the children that have adjudicated um, as um, status offenders or who are delinquent. So they were able to screen 107 youth in March and 60 in April, and 79% um, of those were positive. Um, so yet another opportunity to, to connect these kids with, with services. So as far as home and community-based services, um, the assessment pathway had 193 children referred from January to March. Um, and just to note that, um, that the pathway just started up um, in, it was October 31st of 2021. So it's fairly new, but we've seen a lot of growth um, towards the beginning of 2022 with that. Um, and so what that does is that that allows um, individuals an opportunity um, to be to be walked through the process to apply for the CSED waiver through Medicaid, um, but they can also get interim wraparound services while they're waiting on that application to be processed. Um, so the, those interim services, which is the BBH mental health wraparound listed here, um, you know, they're, they're all considered part of one total wraparound. Um, so it won't be any different for the child, um, just a payer source change. But there was 117 served um, in the last quarter of 2021. And then as far as CSED services, um, in the last six months of 2021, um, there were 233 kids approved. Um, so that's approximately a 70% increase um, compared to the first half of 2021. So um, seeing a lot of growth there and, and kids being able to use the home and community-based services. Um, some other services that, that we look at is um, 
So positive behavior support or behavioral support services are provided through um, WU Center for Excellence in Disabilities, and they were able to serve 102 youth in the last six months of 2021. Um, there were 11 enrollments um, for assertive community treatment. Um, and just keep in mind, we only look at individuals age 18 to 21 for that. Um, so, so we did look at that a little closer um, to determine you know, opportunities for outreach there. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, there is stabilization and treatment homes that are being developed. Um, so we'll keep a close, on eye, close eye on that once that starts up. And then for the last six months of 2021, um, there was 187 calls to the crisis line. And the crisis line um, has a couple functions, um, just to note it, um, they're able to do screenings for people who call in and actually refer them to the assessment pathway themselves. And then they also get the, um, the referrals from the primary care providers going through health checks so that they can refer them to the assessment pathway and start that process with them. So there were 502 youth that, um, that interacted with mobile crisis um, in the last quarter of 2021, and that was an increase from the previous quarter. So we're continuing to watch that and that need, but that is also a service that's offered um, while children are waiting to, um, to be connected to the CSED waiver wraparound services, if that's, if that's the option their family chooses. Um, so this is just a graphic of the um, number of referrals to the assessment pathway. So you can see how those have increased um, month after month. Um, as this has been expanded. Um, and we do have um, most individuals, 65%, with a qualifying CAFIS PECFIS score. So they have to have a score of over 90 um, assigned to a facilitator within 30 days of referral. So that that all that to say, um, you know, when kids and families are helped out through the process, they are able to um, get assigned a wraparound facilitator, aka connected to services within about 30 days. Um, so that's another metric that we're looking at. We're keeping a close eye on timeliness because we know that's really important to families and, and can really impact their experiences and um, outcomes as well. So as far as residential mental health treatment, um, the state has a goal to, um, to get that number to 822, um, so the total census for, for youth in residential um, by the end of this year. Um, and as of July 15th, it was at 814. Um, so we continue to monitor that and, um, and look at seasonal trends. Um, but one of the ways that, that we're looking at um, diver diverting youth or um, reducing their time um, in residential when it's unnecessary is we've started out by looking at youth that have a um, CAFIS PECFIS less than 90. So, um, you know, I previously said that they had to have greater than 90 to get, um, to be eligible for the CSED waiver or wraparound. So if they're in residential and they have less than 90 or they've, you know, they've worked their treatment program and they're less than 90, then these are kids that can be prioritized for discharge. Um, so we're really looking closer at their barriers to why they can't discharge. Um, you know, some of the things that we're seeing are um, that, you know, the child may not have a foster family to discharge to. Um, and then some, and some of the other things that we're looking really closely into is the age of these individuals, because we are seeing that um, there is a much larger proportion of individuals that are, um, that are 18 to 21 as compared to um, the, in, the overall um, population in these facilities. Um, so the ones that are 18 to 21, um, you know, there is a lot more of them that have this less than 90 CAFIS score. Um, so we're thinking through that process and some of those needs there, whether it be through um, through foster homes or um, transitional living, depending on the age of those individuals. Um, and so we are, we do look at maps um, and to look at, at the rate and the number of um, individuals that are placed, we are starting to um, compare that with some of the referrals and utilization. Um, 
that is that is going on across the state to try to help inform our decision making for outreach and education. Um, and we also keep a, a close eye on bed utilization, um, both in and out of state, because um, there are some different needs there. So for the discharge plan I was just talking about, um, as far as that is currently in state. So one of the next steps would be to move that to out of state placement. But a lot of times kids are placed out of state because they have specialized needs that aren't able to be met in state. So that's one of the things that we're able to um, be informed on based on this data is um, you know, some of our next steps for, for what it will look like to expand in-state services to meet these needs so that kids could go home sooner because they'll be you know, more connected with their families and their communities by staying closer. Right. We also, again, look at that length of service um, and you, know, you can see that the out-of-state is much higher. Um, I believe it's on average about three months longer than the in-state. Um, and so that's something that we're watching closely to identify, you know, what are those needs that, that are keeping kids out of state that we can try to address? Um, we also have um, evaluations from our partners at Marshall University and um, West Virginia University. Um, this is an example here of, of one from W's recent evaluation of um, providers and community responses. Um, and it's just awareness of some of the services I've just talked about. And so we're able to take this information and layer it with the data that we're already looking at and, um, and be able to say, okay, like for instance, the sort of community treatment, I know I mentioned it before, um, you know, it's only available for individuals 18 plus. So it's only part of this population that we're looking at, which falls zero to 21. Um, but it is an important option for older individuals. And so um, we are looking at how we can increase training, um, both for, for individuals that may be discharging that could use the service there, um, as well as making sure that that is a choice when somebody goes through the assessment pathway if they are, if they are 18 or older. And um, our, our evaluations also cover um, youth and caregiver perspectives. So that's some, some additional things we'll be looking at. Um, and then Marshall is doing a fidelity assessment that should be available um, either late, later this year or early 2023, um, which will um, assess the fidelity of our wraparound programs and um, you know, provide any improvement or sustainability opportunities there as well. So um, I won't take the time to go through all this. I think I've mentioned several things um, as, we, as, we, as we've talked, but you know, just some next steps as far as, um, as, far as reviewing this data. You know, the big thing is, is that we don't wanna have data reports just for the purpose of having data reports. You know, all of this is, is meant to inform planning and action. Um, so, we're just really trying to take this information and figure out, okay, what are the next steps that are available, whether it, whether it be through policy change, um, sustainability, um, or, or you know, expansion of outreach, awareness of services, et cetera. Um, so continuing to keep an eye on, on these things and, um, and um, getting, it's, it's been a great experience because, um, you know, we've really been able to um, connect the bureaus and have conversations across um, the DHHR so that we can work together as well as with our stakeholders um, so that we really aren't working in these silos anymore. We're able to make sure that the gaps are filled in from there. All right, and this is my contact information. Um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions and, um, we also have, again, the, the Kids Thrive website that has that information um, about our semi-annual report. And um, we have some quick stats there as well as information for um, families and caregivers to get access to services if you'd like to check that out or share it with others. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. I know we have at least one question in the chat and it was, uh, Laura, do children who receive BBH mental health wraparound moved to CSED waiver, or is it a separate subset? So um, I think to answer that question, it, it might depend, but I think for general cases, 
Um, once they go through the assessment pathway process and final determination is made, like they've had their um, assessments and evaluations done, um, if they were approved for CSED, then they would go ahead and move to CSED. But in most cases, they're able to keep that same facilitator. So for these kids, it's the kids and their families, it's not really a change, except they just say, okay, you know, you're approved for CSED now and, you, you know, your services might expand a little bit um, based on what's available, whether it be respite or some other services available. But, um, you know, really it's just a billing change on the state side. Um, and it's the idea that, Fidelity through wraparound should be the same, um, no matter no matter what entity is paying for it. Now there may be some exceptions um, to, to where an individual might qualify outside of um, CSED, and so BBH might cover it then. But um, I think for general cases, it it would be that transfer to CSED. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Birgit Stanholzer. She's the director for the West Virginia Statistics Center. And I will let her get set up. I think that we're going to help her with slides. Okay. Are you all going to show my slides? I think we are. <laughs> okay, great. Um, I just want to give a shout out to a couple other people who are here today on this meeting. Tonya Cheney is the director of the epidemiology division here in the Health Statistics Center. And Mandy Harper is our brand new epidemiologist who's going to be analyzing the drug overdose data from here on out. So I'll be turning that, we'll be training her and turning that over to her soon. Thanks, Birgit. Glad to be here. <laughs> Okay, are you all displaying the presentation or do I need to? We are. Give me just okay. a second. It's loading. Yeah, I was, I was worried that I would have te technical difficulties. <laughs> no, it's just taking its good old time. Okay. And while you're waiting, um, Kim, I saw somebody asked about sharing the slide decks. Will you all continue to have those on the SEOW website? I'm a, sorry. Yes, that's our plan when we're done. Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Thanks, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Today, I'm going to share with you some 2020 and provisional 20 or preliminary 2021 statistics, drug overdose mortality statistics. Um, this first slide here has 2021 West Virginia resident deaths and those that occurred in West Virginia. Uh, this first one has West Virginia residents deaths for 2021 at 1,493. Of those, um, 14, about 1,410 of those died in state. Now, this is kind of a change from previous years. Um, 83 West Virginia residents actually died out of state. I say this has changed because you in the past years, it's been a lot fewer, um, maybe 40, 50. Um, you'll see a trend here too, kind of a pattern, so to speak. Um, 20 of those died in Ohio, 12 in Virginia, 12 in Maryland, 11 in Kentucky, and eight in Pennsylvania. So we're talking about border states here. The remaining died in various other locations, Florida, North Carolina, South Carolina, and I've listed all the other states there. In 2021, we had 1,504 West Virginia occurrences deaths. That means people who died in West Virginia, no matter where they reside. And for those of you who get the internal DHHR update every month, you can see there's already been a change. Um, when I ran this last week for this presentation, it was 4, 1,504 occurrence deaths, and now we're up to 1,507. 
So that can change. That's why I'm saying these are still preliminary, preliminary statistics here. Um, out of state residents who died in West Virginia, there were 95 of those last year. Again, you're gonna see a pattern here, 32 from Ohio, 15 from Pennsylvania, 12 from Virginia, 10 from Maryland, and four from Kentucky. I put North Carolina down there as well because there were seven of those. Um, other states, South Carolina, Florida, um, are included in that as well. Next slide. So I'm gonna go through West Virginia occurrences first and then talk about West Virginia resident statistics. So next slide, please. Okay, this is how many drug overdose deaths have occurred in West Virginia over the past 20, 22 years. And you can see in 2020, we did have, where we had been decreasing, we did have an increase again in the number of deaths occurring in West Virginia and last year was even higher. Next slide. Um, I'm showing you all this one because I wanna make you aware of a couple of peaks that have happened in the past few years. There was a peak in April of 2020. That's that 168 figure in that month alone. And you can guess what was going on then, right? The very beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, we did have a couple other spikes, I believe, in January, February of 21, and then again in April of 21. So I'm just pointing out these to you in case you know of any other um, things going on in behavioral health that may have impacted that. Uh, next slide, please. This graph shows um, various different drugs that were involved in drug overdose deaths that occurred in West Virginia over the past few years. That yellow line is fentanyl, which we know that fentanyl and fentanyl analogs have been increasing quite a bit in West Virginia. That red line is methamphetamine. Met I wanna caution when I cover these two is that these are often combinations of drugs that are involved in the death. It's not usually not a single drug that's involved. So it could be a combination. So these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, you can see the blue line, heroin had increased, but now it's decreasing very rapidly. So we're not seeing heroin involved in a lot of deaths in West Virginia now. One thing we are keeping an eye on is there's a little uptick uptick in alprazolam, and there's another one that I'll talk about here in just a few minutes. So next slide. Xylazine is another drug that we're kind of keeping an eye on. It's relatively new, um, but over the past few years, it has been increasing. So we're gonna keep an eye on that as well. And this is not just in West Virginia, this is in, happening in other states as well. Next slide. Um, as I said, Typically, a, a drug overdose death does not involve just one drug. It usually in, involves multiple drugs. So here, this slide is showing an increase in the combination of fentanyl and methamphetamine. In 21, more than half of methamphetamine-related deaths also involved fentanyl. Um, you can see heroin and fentanyl combination has been decreasing, and heroin and meth combination is decreasing as well, mostly due to the fact that um, heroin is decreased. Next slide. This uh, shows a combination of heroin and cocaine and fentanyl and cocaine, because um, we were seeing for a while that the combination of heroin and cocaine had been on the increase, but that's now declining. So the combination now is cocaine with fentanyl. Next slide. Um, we also looked at cocaine and meth amphetamine with, combined with any other opioid. Um, you can see that methamphetamine with another opioid with an, any opioid has is increasing. If you compare it to the graph that's right beside of it, methamphetamine without an opioid, it has been kind of steady. So that again, that combination is increasing. Next slide. Um, I have a slide for this of change from 
2019 to 2020, and then the next slide is going to be a change from 2020 to 2021. Um, you can see the, some of the differences um, between 2019 and 2020. There was an increase in fentanyl, alprazolam, meth, and gabapentin. So gabapentin is also one that we're going to be keeping a close eye on. Next slide. This is the change from 2020 to 2021. You can see heroin has really decreased. So that's, we're talking about a 70% decrease there between those two years. Hydrocodone has decreased as well. Things that we are seeing that are still continuing to increase are methamphetamine, fentanyl, cocaine, and again, gabapentin. We're going to keep an eye on that as well. So this just has a general breakdown of the percentage of overdose deaths in West Virginia by drug type. Again, these are not mutually exclusive. So this is not gonna add up to 100%, obviously. 82% um, of West Virginia deaths involved an opioid, 76% involved fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, 52% included meth. And again, you had seen that large increase in methamphetamine involved. Um, drug overdose deaths. 11% um, still like, you know, one in 10 or so involve cocaine, one in 10, gabapentin. So again, those are some things that we're going to keep an eye on. So now I'm going to present to you some West Virginia resident statistics where we can actually compare what's happening among West Virginia residents to other states in the United States, as well as we can make comparisons between county. This first slide here shows West Virginia age adjusted mortality rates for West Virginia, as well as the US. And again, these are preliminary statistics, but the National Center for Health Statistic, which, Statistics, which is part of CDC, has been releasing provisional drug overdose deaths as well as provisional birth, birth statistics and death st statistics. Um, so th the US numbers came from CDC Wonder. And I can tell you this again, when I was updating these slides, it the numbers changed for 2021 um, on nearly a monthly basis. So keep that in mind that these are still subject to change. Um, you can see West Virginia in the light blue has taken a large increase, considering that our general population has decreased over these same years. Um, and just so you know that this isn't just a West Virginia trend with increasing drug overdose deaths, this is a national trend as well. And you can see in the darker blue line, the U.S. age-adjusted rates are also increasing. Next slide. Um, this is for 2020, and then I have 2021 preliminary on the next slide. Um, this is showing how West Virginia compares to other states. We do rank number one and have the highest age-adjusted drug overdose death rate in, this, in the nation. You can see our rate there, our next closest um, number two is um, DC at 58.1 per 100,000 population. So we're like, you know, a lot, unfortunately, we're not higher than our, the next closest state or jurisdiction. Um, our neighbor over in Kentucky, um, 49.2 per 100,000. So you can show the next slide, please. This is 2021 and it's preliminary, so it is subject to change. However, we are again ranked number one so far, and DC is the next highest. And you can see there where West Virginia is at 90.8 per 100,000, whereas DC is at 60.3 per 100,000. Um, Tennessee seems to be increasing. Kentucky is also in the top five states. So some of our neighbors as well are fairly high. Next slide, please. Um, manner of death, um, I put this up there just so you can see um, most of these drug overdose deaths are ruled as an accident. Um, 
So just keep that in mind. Usually an accidental overdose. We, there are some that are um, suicides, but not many. Um, this shows West Virginia resident crude mortality rate. Um, this is age and gender specific rates that I'm showing you here. Um, the slightly grayish kind, I don't know how it's showing up on your, on your monitors, but the kind of the, the grayish or the darker blue slide uh, scale is males and females is in the lighter blue. Almost looks like a bell curve, right? So we definitely see that the rate, the overdose rate is higher among males than females. But we also see that the age distribution is similar for males and females, though females are lower. But you know, um, the age group that we tend to see most of the drug overdose deaths in are the 35 to 44 age group. This next slide, this is, I wanted to show this because um, I think this is interesting and something very, that you, that you should keep in mind when you're looking at statistics. This is the number of deaths in 2021 by race and ethnicity. So you can, see, you would think, just look at this and think, oh, okay, well, that's probably corresponds pretty well to our um, race ethnicity population distribution. Um, only 82 black, non-Hispanic, nine other non-Hispanic and eight Hispanic. So the majority are still, deaths are still among white non-Hispanics. But on the next slide, back one. Sorry about that. This shows the crude mortality rate. So remember the numbers were way up for white non-Hispanic and fairly low for black non-Hispanic. But when you take um, population into consideration, you can see that there's definitely um, higher almost proportion of black non-Hispanic uh, drug overdose deaths for that particular population. Next slide. So I broke this down by a couple of other things that I thought you all might be interested in. Educational attainment, this is just percentage, um, percentage of, of deaths. And you can see that, uh, you know, over half of the drug overdose deaths for 2021 occurred among people who had a high school education, GED, high school diploma. Um, and also you can see there are some college, college degree, as well as those who had less than a high school degree. Next slide. Um, this is deaths by, percentage of deaths by marital status. Um, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, the, the largest percentage group were never married, uh, followed by those who were divorced. And then the third highest group was those who are married. Um, so that's something I think to keep in mind too about, um, you know, a high proportion of drug overdose deaths among those who are never married. Next slide. Um, so the next two slides show um, drug overdose deaths by county in West Virginia. Um, the, let's see. Um, Cabell County had the highest rate at 127 per 100,000. McDowell County had the second highest rate. Um, but again, you can see the darker colors are the higher rates. So you can definitely see the areas of the state um, that have um, uh, the highest rates of drug overdose mortality. Um, the white areas where it says suppressed, um, we suppress if there's less than um, if there's too few deaths to really make the, the statistic reliable. Next slide. Okay, this is opioid related. Um, Cabell County still had the highest rate for any op opioid related drug overdose deaths um, and Logan had the second highest. There's a slight change in the pattern here, but you could still see the darker shaded counties have the higher mortality rate for opioid related drug overdose deaths. And you can see more counties are suppressed too because not all drug overdose deaths are opioid related. Next slide. Okay, this one I thought was kind of interesting and something um, that is 
kind of personal for me and um, and that is drug overdose deaths looking at veteran status um, and little does Mandy know but this is one of the things that I am going to have her look into in more depth pretty soon um, because this is just among drug overdose deaths what percentage were veterans and when, what percent um, were not veterans but I want to look at kind of all of our deaths among veterans to see if drug overdose deaths are one of the higher ones or if there's some other cause of death that might be higher. Again, I think it's interesting um, and definitely an area for of attention. So what's next? Drug combinations, we're going to look at things like the average number of drugs that are involved. That's something we've done historically, but we hadn't done in recent years. And also drug combinations by sex and age to see if women or men and men have different combination, combinations of drugs involved with the death or if there's a difference by age. Um, on the national horizon, um, we've been asked to look at adolescent drug overdose deaths and see what kind of drugs are involved with those. Um, we're going to look at new drug types. Like I said, xylazine kind of came on the on the scene a couple of years ago, and that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at other new things. Um, one thing that I am seeing reported on death certificates is um, Delta 9 and other cannabinoids. So that may be something that we look at in the future. Um, we, we did kind of a, a general look at the county rates, but we're going to expand that as well. We're going to look at occupation and industry, hopefully in a little bit more detail. Um, there's, we did that in the past, and again, because we haven't had an epidemiologist devoted to this, except for me, unfortunately, for uh, over a year now, uh, we didn't have time to do some of these um, analyses that we've done in the past. Um, so, like I said, also an expanded veteran analysis. There is a couple of other things that are collected on the death certificate that we want to look at a little bit more detail. Other significant conditions that may be other conditions or co-conditions, comorbidities that might also possibly explain some of the drug overdose deaths. And then a deeper dive into the analysis of the injury description where it's listed as whether or not there is an illicit drug involved, a prescribed drug, a non-prescribed drug, and also where the injury occurred. Um, historically, it's been usually either in the decedent's home or a neighbor's home or a friend's home. But we wanna look at that in a little bit more detail. So again, there's my, con my contact information and hopefully over the next couple of months, Tony and Mandy, you'll be hearing from them a little bit more. Well, I th thank you so much. That was very excellent information. I think there were a lot of positive comments in the chat. Uh, one person did ask about the slides and I wasn't sure where that landed with your talking about how the information wasn't final. It's, it is still preliminary. Um, let me check on sharing the slides. Um, just just again, if, if I do get to ch share the slides, just keep in mind that's subject to change. And can we reach out to you to get further information and talk with you? Definitely. Because uh, the information you're sharing I do um, out of our Bureau of uh, Behavioral Health, it really helps to drive and inform our substance use prevention efforts. So this is stuff that my regional prevention lead organizations data that they've been wanting and needing. And so, yeah, I just, I just screenshotted your information and you're gonna hear from me. <laughs> yeah, I think they put it in the chat too. So yeah, just go ahead and email me. Yes. Okay, any other question for Birgit? Okay, again, thank you one more time. Thanks. Thanks everyone for attending. Now, before we close, does anyone have um, any announcements, upcoming meetings or presentations that might be of interest to the group? Going once, okay. Um, again, thanks so much for attending. You've been wonderful. The information's been good. Uh, please save the date for our next meeting, which should be November the 10th at 2 p.m. And um, we will see you then. Um,
Thank Karen, you very much. It, yeah. it probably isn't too early to um, talk about our Poly Substance Summit that is coming up in December. Um, please save the date if that is of interest to you. Um, it will be December 14th and 15th. It will be all virtual. Um, and it is free to attendees. So um, please do go to the BBH website. If you just Google BBHWV, you can get there, sign up, and you will get information about that summit. Um, if you are interested in following up, we also put information about the prevention activities that are happening at the local level in West Virginia, as well as um, and relatedly, the Save a Life Free Naloxone Day coming up in early September. So we encourage you to be involved with those activities as well. As Tawny mentioned, prevention and research go hand in hand, and we really appreciate all of you participating in this. We'll be sure to post whatever we can to the website. And um, I just want to echo Kim. Um, very informative meeting today, and we thank you for attending. And um, Dr. Boyd, um, we're so glad to be able to share with this group about what you all do with the white coat ceremony and sharing the lock zone. Um, did you have another announcement for us? Yes, um, I am on the uh, West Virginia Physician um, Medical Physicians Health Program, Medical Practitioners Health Program. And they have an annual conference on, uh, which I just put in the chat, I think I did, yeah, um, for uh, prescription drug abuse conference. And it's gonna be held September 22nd to the 24th in Morgantown. So I put that link in there, um, great speakers and should be a really informative conference. You probably all know about it, but in case you don't, that's it, it's in the chat. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd. We also see some other events that um, our friend Jenny Lancaster has put in here. Thank you, Jenny. Back to you, Kim. Any other announcements? Okay. Um, and if you have any other comments or ideas for speakers or someone you want to hear from, uh, feel free to reach out um, to our to this email. Uh, Brandy's email is actually in the chat for that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and we will see you in a couple of months.